Hello, I'm Dr. Ailey Kalapilla from Emory University. In this National HIV Curriculum mini-lecture, I'm going to provide a brief update on the latest latent tuberculosis infection management and treatment guidelines for people living with HIV. So this is the outline of my talk. First, let's review some background on latent tuberculosis infection, which I will refer to now as LTBI. So when should you screen for LTBI in people living with HIV? According to the Opportunistic Infection Guidelines, patients should be screened for latent TB infection at the time of their HIV diagnosis and or entry into care. Of course, the reason that this is recommended is that HIV is a risk factor for progression of LTBI to active tuberculosis and is also associated with poor outcomes should an individual develop active TB. Also, there are now safe and effective treatments for LTBI, which we will look at more closely later in this talk. So really, all people with HIV should be routinely screened for LTBI. Now, many of the screening tests that we use to detect LTBI are imperfect and can be falsely negative, especially when the CD4 count is low, that is less than 200. Given this, persons with advanced immunosuppression should be re-screened when they have some more immune reconstitution, that is when their CD4 count is greater than or equal to 200. Annual repeat screening is only recommended in situations where there is high risk for ongoing to repeat exposure to persons with active TB, such as incarceration, travel to TB endemic countries, residing in congregated settings like shelters or nursing homes, and homelessness. Now let's review our diagnostic toolkit to detect LTBI in people with HIV. There are two main methods for detection of LTBI, the tuberculin skin test, which I will refer to now as TST, and the interferon gamma release assay, also commonly referred to as IGRA. The TST basically entails giving the patient an intradermal injection of tuberculous mycobacterial antigens and then evaluating the cutaneous induration 48 to 72 hours later. The expectation here being that the intradermal antigens will stimulate a T-cell-mediated type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction in persons with either active or latent TB infection, which causes the induration. The IGRA is an in vitro blood-based test, so a patient's blood specimen is obtained and then incubated in the lab with TB-specific antigens, and the test is looking for the release of interferon gamma when the T lymphocytes are stimulated by TB-specific antigen. The interferon gamma response is quantified and reported out as positive, negative, or indeterminate. Since both the TST and the IGRA rely on host T-cell-mediated immune responses, you can see here why these tests could be unreliable, particularly in the setting of advanced immunosuppression when T-cells are low. So now let's talk about when we need to start LTBI treatment in people with HIV. So an important point to note here is that both the TST and the IGRA do not distinguish between active and latent TB infection. So a negative LTBI result does not rule out active tuberculosis, and any patient with a positive TST or IGRA must first be ruled out for active TB prior to initiating LTBI treatment. So LTBI treatment is indicated if a patient has a positive LTBI screening test and there is no evidence of active TB infection and the patient has not had prior treatment for either active or latent TB infection. The other time LTBI treatment is indicated is if an individual has had a significant exposure to an active TB case. These individuals should be treated for LTBI regardless of their LTBI screening test result. Now we will review the preferred LTBI treatment regimens for people with HIV. This is a table briefly summarizing the old and the new recommendations for preferred LTBI treatments. The new recommendations reflect the most recent updates for LTBI management in the Opportunistic Infection Guidelines. 
Specifically, while the older guidelines recommended six to nine months of isoniazid alone as the preferred LTBI treatment regimen for people with HIV, as of February 2022, the OI guidelines now recommend two shorter course regimens. These are isoniazid plus pyridoxine plus rifapintine, all taken once weekly for 12 weeks, or isoniazid plus rifampin taken once daily for three months. Now, let's look more closely at the two preferred LTBI treatment regimens. With regard to the weekly isoniazid plus rifapintine for three months, the rifapintine dosing is weight-based and there are several drug interactions between rifapintine and antiretroviral drugs, so in general, this LTBI treatment regimen is only recommended for patients who are virologically suppressed and who are receiving an antiretroviral combination regimen that is anchored by either efavirenz, dolutegravir, or raltegravir. Also, tenofovir alafenamide, or TAF, cannot be used with rifapintine due to drug interactions, and this is really important to note because TAF is a commonly used nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor backbone that is found in many single-tablet fixed-dose combination antiretroviral regimens. So, for example, Bictegravir TAF FTC, which is a commonly used single-tablet antiretroviral regimen, cannot be used concomitantly with rifapintine. Now, shifting gears to the 3-HR regimen, so daily isoniazid and rifampin for three months, rifampin is another drug that is notorious for drug interactions due to its ability to induce cytochrome P450 enzymes. So, once again, one needs to be mindful of this when pairing the LTBI regimen with a suitable combination antiretroviral regimen. For example, rifampin use is not recommended in persons receiving antiretrovirals such as protease inhibitors, cabotegravir, bictegravir, elvitegravir covisistat, ropivirine, duravirine, among many others. Clinicians can refer to drug interaction tables in the Opportunistic Infection Guidelines for further details. So finally, in any regimen that uses isoniazid, pyridoxine or vitamin B6 should also be provided to avoid isoniazid-related peripheral neuropathy. So now let's review some of the clinical trial data that led to the change in the LTBI treatment guidelines. Several clinical trials have demonstrated that the 3-HP regimen has efficacy equal to standard isoniazid monotherapy with the added benefit of improved adherence and completion rates due to its shorter duration. Similarly, clinical trials involving adults and children who are seronegative for HIV demonstrated that the 3-HR regimen was comparable to six months or longer of daily isoniazid in terms of decreasing the risk of progression to TB disease decreased risk of hepatotoxicity, and decreased drug toxicity causing treatment discontinuation. Furthermore, in studies that recruited individuals with HIV, there was no significant difference in rates of developing TB disease among those taking 3-HR compared to those taking six months or longer of daily isoniazid. So based on this data, both of these two regimens, 3-HP and 3-HR, have now been listed as the preferred LTBI treatments for people with HIV in the Opportunistic Infection Guidelines. Now, let's move on to talk about alternative LTBI treatment regimens that are mentioned in the OI Guidelines. The 6-9 to nine months of isoniazid, which used to be a preferred regimen, is a regimen that is no longer considered a preferred LTBI treatment in people with HIV and is now an alternative in the most recent iteration of the OI guidelines. The biggest advantage with this regimen, of course, was that there were very few drug interactions with current antiretroviral regimens. Other alternative LTBI treatment regimens include four months of daily rifampin, abbreviated here as 4R, or one month of daily isoniazid plus rifapentine, abbreviated here as 1HP. As I mentioned in the previous slides, both rifampin and rifapintine have several drug interactions with antiretrovirals, which need to be taken into account when pairing the right HIV treatment with LTBI treatment. So in summary, all persons with HIV warrant LTBI screening. LTBI treatment is indicated if the screening test is positive 
or if the patient has had recent close contact with an active TB case. The two newly recommended preferred LTBI treatment regimens include 3-HP or weekly isoniazid plus rifepentin for three months or 3-HR which is daily isoniazid plus rifampin for three months. If these preferred regimens are not feasible for the patient, the OI guidelines do list three alternative LTBI treatments. Personally, as a clinical provider, I can tell you that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to selecting an appropriate LTBI treatment for your patients. I tailor my decision, which may include modifications in either LTBI treatment plan or antiretroviral regimen, based on patient-specific circumstances, paying very close attention to drug interactions. The production of this National HIV Curriculum Mini-Lecture was supported by funding from the Health Resources and Services Administration.